everybody. Uh, I hope you're all fueled by coffee and awake again. So um, we had a few talks about design systems already. So this is going to be different again. So if you saw the other two, don't worry about it. So when you start a new application, consistency seems really, really easy. New screens are designed and developed closely together, often by just a single designer and engineer. So if you have any small inconsistencies, you can iron out them quite quickly by just going through the application together and iron out to those small issues. But fast forward a few years, and the situation often looks quite different. New people joined, others left, and the design, as well as the features of the application, changed a lot. And suddenly, you end up with 10 different buttons and different screens that just look and behave very different because they were built at different times by different people. So is this something that sounds familiar to you? Maybe. Yes. Cool. So this talk's for you. So I work at Deliveroo, and Deliveroo is a food delivery service. So we have three applications to build, a consumer, a restaurant, and a rider application. And all of these three applications were built by different teams. So while there were some similarities, there were a lot of inconsistencies and different components. So while these applications looked like they were built by the same application, you couldn't drop in a component from another application into another one. It just would look off. So we wanted to have a unified design across all of these three applications and have our Deliveroo design. So how do you get from this mess to a consistent look and feel? And how do you ensure it actually stays consistent going forward? So we decided to tackle this problem by using a design system. So we had a few talks about design systems already, but apparently there's a few people still in the audience who don't know what it is. So for you, this is what it is. So essentially, you have a set of visual styles, UI components, and guidelines that are used to build applications. And these components can come with constraints and rules. For example, a button can only have three different types, like a primary, secondary, and a tertiary type. Or a specific textile can only be used for headings, for example. And all of these constraints and rules help with consistency by giving people something to work with. You don't have to work with a blank canvas. You have some rules. You know kind of what you have to use. Now, there's one design system I quickly want to talk about, and that is material design. Before, Android, uh, before the introduction of material design, Android was really known for its inconsistency. Applications would look very, very different. And even within the operating system, there were a lot of inconsistencies. There also weren't a lot of components that could be used. And so every application had to write their own navigation drawer, for example. And they would all look and behave differently. So that caused a lot of confusion to the user. You never knew what would happen when you tapped on that navigation drawer icon. So with the introduction of material design, this slowly changed. Google released a set of guidelines to follow and components to use. And with this, consistency slowly started to happen, with applications actually following these guidelines. And now, material design works across multiple platforms. So you can use material design to create a consistent design across all of those platforms. So chances are, you're already using some design system of some sorts. But what if you want to create your own? How do you actually start? And when and how do you create components? And how do you then distribute these? Before you get started, you need to make sure that you really have engineers and designers on board with this. If only designers are on board, you're still going to have custom components across your application. So whenever your beautiful component in the design side changes, in the application side, you still have to go over every use case of it. And on the other side, if only engineers are using some sort of design system or component set, you're still going to get custom components from design. So whenever this happens, you either have to update this component and add another special case to it, or end up not using the component. So you really need to work together in this. And it's good to kind of have some kind of sponsor or like somebody who's pushing forward uh, this drive um, from both sides. At Deliveroo, the initial drive came from our designers. They had to build four versions of every screen, an iOS, an Android, a mobile web, and a desktop web version. So this is very, very time consuming. 
And while we did have some shared components, there were not a lot of rules around this. And so you still ended up with a lot of custom components and inconsistencies across the application. So simplifying this process made a lot of sense for us. And so a design system team was created. This design came up uh, with a unified set of standards and components that could be used across all our platforms while still following platform conventions where it really makes sense, like navigation or text input, for example. So you don't end up with an Android app that looks or behaves like an iOS app or vice versa. Now, this design system lives in Figma, and that's useful for two reasons. First, both designers and engineers can use exactly the same tool. So both sides see exactly the same content. You can also see the changes in real time. So as a designer is currently working on a component, you can give feedback um, and help them actually create this component. You never have to wait for somebody to export the latest changes or work with an old version uh, and uh, end up building the wrong implementation because it's based on an old design because somebody forgot to export, for example. So that's the design side. On the Android side, we wanted to avoid re-implementing our components across our free applications. Even before we had a design system, we realized we were building the similar components, uh, and we wanted to avoid implementing them across all of them. So we decided to share them. We already had some sort of shared repository where our common architecture lived, so we decided to create a module in there, which we called UIKit. This name turned out to be less than ideal because it would clash with iOS's UI kit. So in the end, only we could use this name. So before you uh, start your work on that, make sure the name makes sense for all of your platforms. But with this separation, it was very clear what is part of the design system and what is just an exception to the rule. So even if you have only one application, I really recommend keeping your design system separate so you can uh, you know what is part of the design system and what's not. And if you ever have to create a new application, you can just drop this design system in or your UI kit into your application without having to worry about integrating any application-specific code. But with the separation, we also had a few challenges. We had to figure out how to integrate this in our application. And we ended up setting up a private Maven repository. So with this, you can publish your um, UI kit module and make it available for everybody within the company. So there's a bit of a setup overhead, but to use it, it's actually really straightforward. You just use it like any other dependency on Android. And you can also do this on iOS with CocaPods. So this is really straightforward for us, but we also had to figuring, figure out our versioning, for example. We wanted to use semantic versioning, like most other applications or dependencies. So we have an indicator of how hard it would be to update to the latest version of our design system. So a major update, whoops, yep, all good. A major update would be for breaking changes. So as you update your design system or UI kit, you have to modify your code as well. A minor change would be for new components, for example. And a patch version would be for little tweaks and bug fixes. We also keep a set of release notes, so you can actually see what the exact change was. Was there a new component? Which one was it? Or was a bug fixed in this release? So you know if you actually really need to update, or what you have to update in your application to use the new designs or the new UI kit. So this might not seem as important if you only have one application, but even then, it can be really useful to see the history of how your UI kit evolved and how much work you've done. And maybe at some point you didn't have the time to use this new component right away, but you can then slowly start migrating to it. So this is how we integrate our UI kit in our application. But while you're working on components, you don't want to work within your application all the time, because it takes quite a lot of time to publish a new version every time. So we created this component browser. So this is kind of similar to what M26 has. So this component has every component that we have and every single possible combination that can come in. So it's very quick to test any changes um, that you make and ensure that all versions of it are still working correctly. It's also very useful to know what exists and what they all support. So as a new person starting on the team, you quickly can figure out which components you can use and what's available. 
Uh, we wanted this to be really easily accessible. So we added it as a standalone application, as well as integrated in a debug panel in our applications. So anybody who has our staging builds installed can quickly access the design system and know which components we have available at this current version. We also published the application internally on the Play Store, so anybody can at Deliveroo can download the application, install it, and see what's available. So this is really helpful to uh, work between our designers and engineers, so they know what we have. All right, so we now talked about the setup a lot, but how do you actually go about creating components? One of the first components we created were colors and textiles. We had a set of brand colors and textiles that we used for many years, so there weren't really anything new for us. We already had all of that set up. But there weren't a lot of rules around this, and a lot of ex exceptions happened, and new styles were added over time, and old ones that should have been removed weren't removed. So we wanted to have a fresh start, and even with something as simple as textiles and colors, we really wanted to do it right. One of the most important things for us to have consistent naming between design and engineers. So you don't have to end up in a situation where you ask your designer what color something should be, and they reply with a name, and you're like, we don't have that. So they tell you the hex code, and turns out you had that color all along. It was just under a different name. So in our UI kit, uh, our design system, all the colors have a name. So this is teal, for example, and then a number indicating the shade. So we're using exactly the same naming in the, on the Android side. And for textiles, every, color has a, every textile has a type. Is it a body or is it a heading? And then a size. And then optionally, you can provide the color as well as if it's bold or regular. So it's very easy to quickly look at the textile and know how to impl implement this in the Android application. But we had to figure out how to then map our old and inconsistent styles to the new ones. And with color, consistency was really, really important for us. So we then wanted to have a mix of old and new colors in the application. Now, luckily, our designers did a lot of really hard work and created a mapping between all the old colors to the new ones. So we could just straightforward replace all the colors in the application. There were a few exceptions that were, weren't covered by this, but we could just go through them together and replace them. With textiles, it was a bit different. We realized the old and the new ones were actually quite similar. So in the end, we decided to wait a bit and only use the new styles going forward. And whenever we worked on a screen, we would just update the old styles to the new ones. Oops. Replacing a new component can be a lot of work, so only go through this option if you really have to. Weigh up your options with your designers and ensure that you only do it if you really, really have to. For us, it did mean going back through our textiles when we had to replace our custom font with a new one. We didn't want to have two different fonts in the application. So we had to go through all our textiles and replace them. But because we already done all the previous work of only using the new ones going forward, it was a lot easier for us. So with colors and textiles defined, a lot of the other components were unlocked for us, because most of them are going to need colors or textiles, or both. And one of the first one we created was a button. We had many, many buttons in our applications, and most of them didn't really match the design system, and there were a lot of inconsistency across them. And even in the design system, the component was really complex. Every button could come in a different type. Is it primary, a secondary, and tertiary version? It could have this destructive state for anything to be deleted. It could be disabled, it could be loading, and it can come with and without an icon. And then it can also be shown on dark backgrounds. You have this inverse state. And finally, you have a small version. So in the end, you can have 84 combinations. And we really wanted to have consistency across all of these combinations and make sure that everything looks and behaves correctly. On Android, you generally have two options to create a component. One is a style, and the other one is a custom view. So our old buttons were just styles because it's the easiest way to get started. You're using the default Android buttons, but you're just giving it a bit of styling. So the button doesn't look like a generic Android button. It looks like a Deliveroo button. This is very flexible. You just override a few properties, and it looks different. 
And if you need a special version, like this green button, you just override the background. But this was also a downside, because you're going to end up with so many different versions very easily, because you're like, ooh, I needed a different padding here, I needed a different size here, I needed a different text style here. And suddenly, you have 10 different buttons in your application, even though they should all look and behave the same way. But styles can also be a bit restrictive. We had difficulties replicating our button component using just styles. We wanted the icon to be aligned next to the text at all times, even if the button was full width. But if you're just using styles, you couldn't actually do that until very recently. So we ended up with a custom view instead. With a custom view, you have full control over your component. So you can support exactly what you want and exactly in the way you want it to. We wanted it to be a bit more restrictive. So it was a lot harder for us to add exceptions. But this is something we did on purpose. So whenever you create a component, choose what works for you. Maybe you want to be more flexible. Or maybe you want to be more restrictive. And inconsistency is important for you. And that can be different on a case-to-case -case basis. And in this case, we opted for consistency. Now, this was a bit specific to Android. But these choices you're going to have to make on either platform. So you're going to have to uh, make those decisions of how you want to set up your component. Now, another thing we wanted to consistent with was the naming. The button in the design system was just called button. So this would clash with the default Android component. So we wanted to avoid the situation where we imported or used the wrong component. Uh, so we added a prefix. And this is a convention we kept using going forward. So every button in a UI kit is very easily identifiable as such. And you can quickly know which components are just um, exceptions and which ones are in the design system. But we didn't just want this consistency to happen with just the component names. We also wanted to have all the properties to be named exactly the same way in the design system as well as in our application. So when you look at a component design, you know exactly what it's going to look like uh, or how, you, how to replicate this component in the application. We wanted it to be really easy to use. So you can configure it both in XML as well as in code. It's just a set of few properties. Apart from these, we don't really allow any other configurations. And that is for two reasons. First, it forces consistency. It can be really, really tempting to give this one button a special look and feel. But if you're not careful, you're going to end up with a lot of special cases like we did before. So being a bit more restrictive, you need a really good reason to break the rules, because it either means creating a custom button or updating the design system. Secondly, it can also simplify the component quite a bit. You don't have to worry about what happens if uh, you change the background, and then you change the type of the button. Should you change the background back? Because usually, if you change the type, the background changes as well. So you don't have to worry about if you don't actually support it. That doesn't stop from somebody from doing it programmatically. But it takes a lot more effort, and they really need to do it uh, on purpose. So both designers and engineers need to be aware of the limitations of a component. You need to work together in this. Both designers and engineers, uh, the component, they should have the same limitations on both sides. You're not going to end up in a situation where you can't replicate a component on either side. So how can you help each other out? From the design side, make sure all the changes to the design system are communicated. We had to find out about a lot of changes to our design system by just looking at the design and making like, hey, this doesn't look like our component. Did it change? Did we implement it wrong? Is this actually not the component that I thought it was? So we had to have those conversations and figure out what happened. And if all the changes would have been communicated in the first place, we would have known about those updates in the first place. Secondly, they can also catch any limitations uh, of a platform. Some changes can be really easy to implement on one platform and really hard on another. So if you just talk to everybody before you actually create this component, can you do this on each platform? You can avoid the mistake where you implement it on one platform where it's very easy. And then somebody tries to implement it on another. And it turns out it's very hard or actually not possible to do this. And then you either have to create a custom version for this platform 
or have to modify the old component, or just spend a lot of effort to make this work. And then, on the other hand, make sure to document your components. Some of the components can be quite complex, and just looking at all the different combinations, it can be hard to figure out what all the properties are and which constraints there are. And this can be also be useful for designers to be able to know when to use this component and when not. But on the engineering side, make sure you clarify the behavior of a component. What should the component actually do? So before you start working on it, sit together with your designer and ensure that there's no misunderstandings across the two sides. We added a bunch of extra functionality that wasn't actually needed. So if we could have, would have talked to each other before working on the component, we could have avoided that. And enable easy access to your components. We do this through the component browser. And that was really helpful for designing us to know what exactly we have available and what we can use easily. So it's a lot about communication. You need to really collaborate a lot to implement the design system well. We now have regular catch-ups with our design system team between our mobile engineers and the designers. So this helped us a lot to prioritize the right things and understand the difficulties on both sides. We could tell each other where we're having issues and what uh, was working really well. And then we could um, make sure we're adding more documentation, for example, so we could implement the components better. All right, so I talked a lot about components now, but when do you actually create one? We don't have a dedicated team for the design system on the engineering side, so we only wanted to create components when we really needed them. So is it actually easier and faster to use an existing component? Is consistency actually really important? And are there actually multiple use cases for this component? And if yes, then yeah, go ahead, create a component. If you only have one use case for a component and you spend a lot of time to implement this really generic, it, you might end up with a lot of wasted time because maybe you're never going to use it anywhere else. But even if you do need it later on, you already have a basis you can work with. And then you can extract it, make it a bit more generic. But you could already figure out a bunch of the issues about how to use this component and what works well and what doesn't. So we had a case a lot of times where a component existed in one application that was needed in another. So we could just work together, extract this component, and make it available for everybody. But components also don't stay static. Your designs are going to evolve, and components are going to change. So how do you go about updating those components? Some of the changes are just going to be visual or additions to the component. So you don't have to worry about these too much. You can just do them. But others are going to be a bit more complicated. Sometimes the component changes in a way that it is a breaking change for the application and require uh, code changes. One example we had where we had this button, which had the destructive type that could live alongside the primary, the secondary, or the tertiary version. So a button could either be primary, secondary, tertiary, or destructive. But we wanted to change this so you could have a destructive version of each of those. Now, this would have been a breaking change. And we used this button in many, many places. So we didn't want to force all three applications to have to update all this code to ensure we're supporting this new property. So in the end, we just deprecated the existing property and added a new one at the same time. So the applications could just gradually uh, migrate to the new property. And the next time we actually did do a major bump, all the usages were gone already. So cleaning them up was quite easy for us to do. Now, there's one component I still want to talk about, and that is icons. Icons were probably one of the most complex things for us to figure out. We had a full icon set from our designers, and we had to figure out how to integrate that in our application. The designers did a lot of the hard work for us. They automatically converted the SVGs into Android vectors files, so they were already in the right format for us. But we didn't quite know how to then integrate the icons properly into the application. We started off by just copying the icons, so this was really useful. We could just copy the icons that we needed, create a different tint and a different size based on what we needed. So it was very easy to use those um, icons. But it also turned out to be quite a pain. 
Once the, application, once the icon was in the application, it was very hard to update it, because as soon as it was in there, you had to manually copy the new version of it. And so our icon slowly became out of date, because we just didn't know which icons to update. Also, copying them turned out to be quite frustrating. So we really had to find a solution for this. Now, we already had the icon set exported in the right format, so we didn't have to worry about that. The icons already lived in the repository, so it was all version controlled, there was a CI set up for it. So in the end, we just ended up building a small Android module around the list of icons, and then published that on our private maiden repository. So whenever the icon set would update, we would automatically publish a new version on our CI and notify us on Slack. And then we could just use our icon set and integrate it like a dependency. So with a single line of code, you update the version of the icon set, and you get all the new icons. So this is really useful for us. Uh, it does mean we have to tint and resize them manually, so it's a bit harder to use them. But at least they're always going to be up to date, and we don't have to copy icons manually across. So this is definitely something I wish we'd done earlier because we now have to go back and update all of those existing item icons to the new ones. So we're now at a relatively good foundation, but there's still a lot more components we have to build and consist inconsistencies we need to iron out. But we've come a long way from over a year ago when we barely had any of that. So what's next for us? Some of the updates to the components are quite tedious, and some of them should pretty much happen automatically. And one of those solutions is design tokens. Now, Roy talked about this uh, on Wednesday already in his talk. But essentially, the design tokens are your core styles. So they're your text styles, they're your colors, and your dimensions. And they can get generated into this JSON format. So whenever the styles changes, the JSON updates and then spits out a platform-specific version. So on Android, you're going to end up with Android styles and resources. So on the developer side, all you have to do is pull the latest version. So with a single line of code, all your text styles and colors can update. So this is very similar to what we're doing with icons. And I'd love to be able to get to something like this with more than just icons. Another thing we might want to consider is dark mode. With both iOS 13 and Android Q releasing dark mode, it's a really hot topic right now. But our design system isn't really set up for it. All the colors are direct colors. So whenever we reference a color, we reference it by its exact name. So when we set a background, it's white. But it should just be your primary background. So if it's on dark mode, it can reference to a dark color. And if it's on light mode, it can be white. So this is a big change for us. So we're not quite sure when and how we can do this. But it's definitely something we want to go towards. And maybe we can do it together with the work of design tokens. So all of this shows we're still very much at the beginning of our journey to a full design system. But it's been really important for us for consistency and speed of development. It also got us a lot closer as a team, both within the Android team as well as with our designers, because we could work together on those components across teams. Creating components is really, really hard. You have to consider a lot of different use cases, ensure your language con is consistent, and they're actually easy to use. But all this effort is really worth it. So I hope this could help you get started on your design system. Thank you. He's coming for questions. <laughs> All right. OK. So uh, you'll see some themes since we've, we've talked about design systems. But uh, something people seem to continue to be interested in is sort of where did the momentum to do design systems come from? Was it something you had to get buy-in? Were you able to prioritize it on your own? So I think. It's something we've been considering for a while, and um, one of our designers was really kind of pushing for it. Um, like, he really wanted to kind of get it done. And he was kind of talking to us engineers to make sure that we're on board as well, um, find the right people who are interested in it, and then kind of sell it as a, 
uh, thing. So both to the designers as well as to the rest of the engineers. So you kind of need like a somebody who's working on it on both sides and is pushing forward for it. So otherwise, if, no, if only a designer is kind of pushing for it and on the engineering side nobody wants to do it, then you're not going to get the benefits from it. And where do you think that first impetus comes from? Where, where, where does somebody decide that they, they want to push for this? I think it was kind of, we, we grew as a company so much and we had so much inconsistencies across the application. So it was, we really wanted to kind of unify this and make it a lot easier for everybody to design and develop. So kind of not having to implement everything four times and um, making it a lot easier for everybody to create a new screen um, and yeah, do all this work. So like efficiencies. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what about iOS and Android? Do you have separate systems there? How do you maintain consistency across platforms? So we, most of the components are cross-platform, but some of them are kind of specific. So when it comes to navigation, text input, they're all custom for Android, iOS, web. Um, but we kind of we create the components on the engineering side when we need them, so we don't necessarily have exactly the same set. Um, but we have the catch-ups with our designers, so we're now kind of finding the gaps on each platform and making sure that we're implementing the same thing and kind of we don't have the issues where one component exists on one platform and not on another. So you, one platform is really inconsistent and the other one isn't. And is there a team that maintains that or is it up to individuals to maintain that system? So on the design side, we have a team who it's like a design ops team who's responsible for it, but uh, on the engineering side, we kind of have a few people who are, care about it a lot, so we have kind of, we call it a task force, uh, where we come together and ensure that we're kind of pushing it forward and that it moves. But at some point, eventually, we are going to have a team who is going to work on it, but we're not quite there yet. And um, in terms of, it sounds very obvious and easy, you know, but uh, it's not that easy. So what have been the biggest challenges uh, that you've actually seen adopting this system? I think just getting started is really difficult because it takes a lot of time for this to actually be useful. So you need to kind of have a really good foundation until you actually get the benefits of it. So at the beginning, when you start on it, it, it can be hard to see, like, how this is going to be useful, because it takes a lot of time to set up all those components and ensure they're set up correctly and everybody can use it and everybody will actually use them. And when you say it's hard to get started, like when, when do you know the right time to actually begin this process? I think it's kind of when you see the pains. So for us it was, you know, we had the three applications and we knew we wanted to have a unified design across them and we didn't want to have to do it across all three applications. So we kind of saw the benefit of it. Um, so, yeah, when you, whenever you see the benefit of it and even if you know it's going to take some time, but if you don't see a benefit of it, then maybe you shouldn't do it yet. But if you get to the size where you do actually see that spending all this effort will actually be worthwhile, then it's a good point. Is there any way that you measure that effectiveness or efficiency saved? Um, not really. We're kind of looking at uh, things like that right now, kind of how many components we're actually using from the design system versus that aren't there yet. So this is kind of something we're starting to look at right now and to see how much we're actually using it, where we're using it, where it's really worthwhile. And uh, is there a system that's beyond just the visuals? Is there things for copy and tone or other things like that? Um, it is all, we, we do have all that in place. It's not part of the design system in a way, but yeah, we have kind of, um, s yeah, systems for which language to use, how, how to translate things as well into different languages, ensure all the copy, like everything is, has exactly the right name and is not inconsistent across the application. So you don't call something, I don't know, order on one screen and then purchase on another, for example. And what kind of challenges do you see uh, creating this system when you have these very different constituents from the, the different apps that you maintain? Sorry? Uh, what are the biggest challenges for the system when you have such different apps for different people? I think that's a good question. Um, 
I think w one thing that's really interesting is, for example, like on the restaurant application, um, do you, or, on, or in the writer application, do you have kind of applications that are being used for hours. It's and as a customer, you use it for a few minutes. So you need to be able to um, get the customer through it very quickly. Versus on the other side, you kind of need to build for um, long time or long livity. Um, and it's also like in the beginning, our writer application, for example, had bigger buttons because to make it a lot easier. So we kind of had to figure out where the right balance of it was if we wanted to keep doing this or if we wanted to favor consistency for over speed um, or for speed, rather. And uh, is there any other sort of value that you look at? Because obviously the consistency for the individuals, the users, they're probably not going to see multiple apps. So uh, is there any value to the customers, or is it more about internal processes? It's more about internal processes. I think, I mean, there are some writers are going to be customers as well, but um, it's not that of a big use case. So it's more for us internally to be able to work a lot faster and uh, not having to re-implement re things. And how do you balance consistency versus differentiation? I mean, if you want uh, things to look very different, you, you might want the apps to, to actually have a unique identity because they're for very different customers. Uh, how do you manage that trade-off? Uh, another very good question. I think um, we, we're, we're kind of now overshooting probably on the consistency side just because before, we were kind of more on the uniqueness. So we're kind of trying, still trying to find a balance of what is exactly right. Um, but I think we currently see the benefits a lot of the consistency, because it just saves a lot of time. And you don't have to worry about how to implement a screen. You just take the building blocks, and you build it together. So at some point, there are probably going to be, we still have things where there's going to be, oh, this screen needs to look a bit different. So we still have those kind of exceptions, and it's just on a case-to-case to case basis. You need mm. to make those decisions and make sure that you're making the right call, and that can change over time. Great. Well, we're out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you.